Hi there, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Welcome if you're currently here in the live premiere. Today we're back again looking at some interesting topics and talking points within Dylan Rounds case. Ranging from Candice Cooley and her connections or how it's worded between her family and Brenner, how it's switched and changed over time and there's a few disagreements there going on in the background. I'll be giving you my thoughts on that and see if we can go any deeper, if it can generate any alternative ideas. Also acknowledging recent comments from the last Dylan Rounds video I did, looking for any questions that need answering or any additional interesting information, as well talking about Lance Kelly and what's supposedly going on back there. So there's a range of interesting topics to talk about today, all relevant to the Dylan Rounds case. Hopefully you can stick around from start to finish to understand it all. As for those that are watching live right now, Feel free to participate, share your thoughts, opinions, reactions in the live chat box on the right hand side of the screen, okay? What I do want to start off with first is by acknowledging that I did do an earlier video today. I did a psychological breakdown analysis of a disturbed individual known as Kathy and Axel. If you'd like to check it out so you're better informed of the backstory of how things unfolded and why they have a grudge and obsession with me, the video is available to watch on my channel. It was done earlier today. You should be able to find it, okay? As for additional links, if you wish to visit the channel or support the channel, whatever, there'll be links down below in the comment section, uh, the pinned comment, if you wish to check that out. As well, shout out to the people that have been present recently, more so last night, because we saw the return of some familiar faces regarding the Kenny Beach MK case community. It was good of people to be present there, as well as those from the Dylan Rouse community that branched on over. It's like a back and forth motion. When I was covering Kenny Veach at the beginning, the start of it all, more so, then transitioning onto Dylan Rounds case and community for the first time ever back in 2022, some Kenny Veach followers came on over, all good. And now here we are, uh, new people within the Dylan Rounds case community, then coming on over to the Kenny Veach one. So it kind of complements each other in some way, but as well, you will always get those mixed spices of interesting personalities and characters which may not quite you know rub too well together technically speaking right when you do get that conflict when you do get those individual characters it is where it is it's just one of those things but as of recently it's been okay on this channel as for any you know for most background stuff whatever's happening is happening i'm completely oblivious to it you know for the most part of it as of recently and onwards, I'm still covering the Dylan Rounds case, Christine Passe Parker missing person case, as well as the Canny Veach M Cave missing person mystery case. There's a range of different ones to look at, okay? And if there is something to cover, an update, an analysis, it will be done. And that's like what we're doing today. So I said, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments. And if you feel like you can't express yourself enough because maybe you're limited to characters, wording, spacing, well, do it down below in the comment section itself, and then it makes it easier for anyone and everyone else to look back at at a later point, a later date, and it can also be read out by me in a future video if it needs to be analysed or questioned or answered, etc. Okay? As for last night overall, what was it like, in my opinion? Was it disruptive? Was it a problem? Was it good? I think, basically, to summarise it, okay, Quite a few people from the Dylan Rounds community are not aware of the Kenny Veach M Cave mystery, but are slowly coming round to learning about it. So it takes time, and that's why I provided links um, and additional add-ons for people to follow. Um, Org is an individual that has mainly followed the Dylan Rounds case and exclusively that case for the first time to his interest. As for the Kenny Veach one M Cave case, um, he's not quite fully aware or alert of it, believes that there could be adjustments and fake factors within by others to generate interest and to make it more of a mystery than it really is and that it supposedly isn't deep. But all I can say, and I'm being 100% honest here, I'm being 100% serious and genuine at the same time, the reality is the people who are likely to downplay the significance and the mystery of the Kenny Veach M Cave mystery, and those are also downplay the severity and serious factor of it when it comes to dealing and trying to solve and investigate it, are likely said by people who 
probably haven't contributed to the case at all, nor have made videos on the case, and maybe some have never heard of it, okay? All I can honestly say is, once you get involved, and I mean you get involved, whether it be boots on ground investigation or media coverage online and analysing, whichever one, once you've digged deep enough, your perspective will change. And if you are on the receiving end, like some of, of us have been on, you'll understand greater, okay? That's all one can say at this moment in time. You have to experience it truly to know the deepness and the darkness of that case, right? And that is why I was able to analyze the Dylan Rounds case as to saying, if you get too close to the truth, you receive resistance. That's exactly what I was saying about the Kenny Veach one. So if there's people out there that downplay the Kenny Veach M Cave mystery, but believe that the Dylan Rounds case is a little bit mysterious, deeper or darker, think again. But there are still crossovers, of course. Maybe a hierarchy, but there is still links between the two in terms of how people behave and react positive and negative, okay? I just wanted to add that in. I would say, you know, the regular people, the ones who are really deep in and involved with the Kenny Veach case, focused last night, questioning, key responses, very helpful, Jeff Clark, more so as well, SB Vegas Adventures, clear, straight to the point, answering questions, keeping focused, doing everything right, very good to see. And then other people as well that regularly watch as well, doing well. As for the, the remainder and others, I said, I don't know what's going on in the background. It is what it is. Uh, but shout out to everybody that was watching last night. And, you know, the people that watch in the background, I would argue and say that, you know, more people last night than the last few months. But that's it. That's mainly because of the topic and case that one is covering at that time. I fully understand that. But as well, quite a few people last night watching in the background and not commenting, which is also a good thing because it shows people are more focused on the video than the chat itself, right? If they're not participating in the chat, then they're most likely watching the video. And the video itself is quite important because it's trying to question, you know, were any clues, any hints given out? And, you know, maybe the comment section will follow later. You know, as more people watch the video down the line and become informed about it. I think as for the thumbnail, it's pretty clear, simple, straightforward. And I do like the thumbnail itself, right? With the Kenny Veach case, you got a good, you know, opportunity and range of supply of thumbnails, right? Because you got boots on ground footage, you got the actual area, you got photos of Kenny Veach. It just makes it a bit more unique and stands out. I mean, it's kind of like Dylan Rounds. You got Dylan's photo, you got the farm, you got the area of Lucent. Just these photos and material to work with can help make your video stand out to then get the message across and the awareness, which is all good. Maybe with the Dylan Rounds one, I'll be honest, it can get hard at times. You know, after making nearly 400 videos on the case, having to make 400 different thumbnails is crazy when you think about it. And I think one last thing just to acknowledge before we like really move on into this video is you will get other people out there covering the Dylan Rounds case and maybe more so just in general, other true crime communities out there. And it might rely on about four to six people to do a live stream together to make a few videos on the case. What has it taken me? One person to make nearly 400 videos of a case all by myself with the help and addition of, you know, viewers and comments and, um, you know, little bits of information here and there and photos, which has been very helpful. It just goes to show that all you need is one person and then a couple of those in the background to be able to, you know, lead to getting to 400 videos almost single-handedly one-man band. So it is doable. It is possible, and I have demonstrated it, okay, which is a positive in its own right. It's not come with excess baggage and all of that, and that's just because I've not, you know, spread myself to here, to there, and all over the place, right? Sometimes you do that, you might get a bit disorientated with thought. And just another observation, you know, people that may branch out and go here and go there and listen in here and listen in there, their own thoughts can get, you know, confused and... Some people's behaviour does change. It just depends what presence and force you're around at the time. If you want clarity, you need to be surrounded by, you know, people that you can get on well with or cooperate with and it should be more effective. If you feel like you're in an environment or a situation where you've got that feeling of dread or you feel like you're being dragged down, maybe it's best trying to eliminate yourself from that presence if possible, right? 
and it might make your thoughts a little bit clearer. I know there's no harm in listening in elsewhere for additional points of views and intel, but if it feels like it's getting too much or over the top, feel free to pull out or pull out in general, okay? And I'm not saying that in a dodgy way. I mean, you know, if you need to do something, you need to do, okay? So, that aside, am I a little bit disappointed from last night? Just a tiny bit, but it's not that bad. Okay, we might get some problematic people here and there, but when when don't we? <laughs> but as I said, whatever's going on in the background is happening, and I think it's still ongoing. Besides that, what I want to start off with first today regarding the Dylan Rounds case is by looking back at the previous comments to acknowledge them, answer any questions, see if there's any interesting information, and also just to allow people to join on into this live premiere as we speak. So we do the comments first, and then I believe we can move on to the bit about Candice Cooley, okay? So let's head on over. So I'm just gonna adjust the comments to the newest. We do have a couple to get through today. First of all, we got one by Ron saying, Kurt Wadsworth said he would solve this case. Now he is the case. How ironic that. Response wise, Christy says, I still wonder why he said that personally. June responding saying fumes from the bleach might have gotten to his head. Possibility, yes. See, this is the thing, just my take on it in general. I think that there are some people out there in the Dylan Rounds case that have over promised and under delivered. You know, those that might have said, yep, yeah, I know exactly what's happened, or yep, yeah, this is going to happen, Dylan's going to be found, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then has it been done? Not always. Sometimes it's been underwhelming. And even those people out there that may have gotten a hold of some kind of evidence or material hyped it up, when it finally was released and shown to the public, what did it really do? Did it lead to Dylan Rounds being found? No. Did it give any clues to who was responsible behind Dylan's death? No. You know, one uh, key example would be that police footage of Dylan and his truck with his friends being pulled on over back in 2021 and it was being hyped up and it's like, okay, well, it's good that there is footage of Dylan in some way or another. It gives a different perspective. It shows the past, but is it relevant to what's happening as of right now or at the time of when Dylan went missing? No. So how can it be used to help find Dylan Round's remains? How can it be used to, you know, be put as evidence in the Dylan Rounds case? It can't because it doesn't really have any connection, right? Sure, you can applaud somebody for doing some kind of background research and a background check, but what does it ultimately lead to? Not much. People overhyped it, blown out of proportion. Even maybe photos out there where some people claim the cred credit for having them for producing them in the first place. Now, did they actually take the photos? No. So you look at Dylan's trailer, Inside and Out, okay? Photos passed around over time. Who are the ones that took the photos? Well, it was, I suppose, that baseball coach and, uh, what, Dylan's friend or something. You know, presence of people who are actually there on site. And then others out there eventually got a hold of those photos and then distributed them out, etc. And then it spread from there. So you get these middle men people that claim it's all down to their own doing and, you know, success. And it's like, well, actually, no, you look back at the origins and it originates elsewhere. So once again, blown out proportion and a bit overhyped, you know, just my thoughts there. As for my channel, I'd say I am an example of someone that has under promised but over delivered. In what way? Well, you know, I didn't say from the start that, hi, I'm here to find Dylan Rounds. I'm going to be the one to find him. I never said that, okay? I said, I'm here to cover the case, to make sense of it, to break things down, to debunk, to analyse, compare, contrast, and keep it alive. And in terms of the over-delivering aspect, that's doing more videos than I ever thought I would be able to do. I mean, originally I thought uploading up to about 250 videos was brilliant enough, but to then go up to doing nearly 400, well, that's uh, on a completely different level, right? But, you know, if there is stuff to cover, then it will be done, and it will be uploaded in a video. Simple as that, but I think it's just one of those things, you know, 
people out there that over promise under deliver it can be underwhelming right it can lead to high expectation where as if you under promise the de- there's no high expectation so then the disappointment is lessened reduced which makes it overall more positive and less toxic in a way but do, does anyone else find it ironic that Kerr said he was going to be the one to solve the case and now he's a part of it why is he a part of it or why is he a case well in the Dylan Rounds one some people are suspicious that he might play a role in some way but besides that besides Dylan's case that own case of what a pending uh, arrest or something a search warrant something like that because Kurt was supposed to attend some kind of court hearing because of a previous action, but he failed to do that, and he's been hiding ever since, so he's got in his own trouble, but, you know, it probably hasn't stopped him in the past, so it's really nothing new there. But let's just look at the additional comments. Someone here is called Nobody Special, saying, do they charge to chat? Well, like Raph, do they charge to chat? Do they charge to chat? What? Exactly think so just kidding who charges to chat i don't know who charges to chat nobody what what were you referring to here are you saying are there other channels out there that charge people to chat i mean really there's no paywall behind a live chat if you wanted to leave a comment on a standard video which could be a members only video well to be able to view it and to be able to comment, then you would have to pay to become a member of that channel, right? That's what you're referring to there. But as for all my videos on the Dylan Rounds case, for the most part of it, it's all public. Publicly viewable and accessible. You can leave comments, you can leave comments in the chat, and you don't have to pay. Okay, so I, I don't know what you're talking about, unless you're referring to another channel out there. What else? Responding to me, did you get the link to Brenner's court papers? Uh, No. I mean, what are you referring to here? I mean, I've looked at Brenner's court papers in the past, but which papers are you referring to? The past ones or something new all of a sudden? And I'm not quite sure who you are. I mean, have you emailed me in the past or something? I don't know. I can't remember. Ron saying, Brenner lives in a gated community. Is that a play on words, that? Christy, very interesting video. You're welcome. That's good. Cleo, handsome genius. Thank you. Appreciate that, Cleo. You're welcome. Tom, what does Tom have to say? The one thing that is overwhelming for me is that we are going back to, if Candice Cooley says it is, it has to be true. That thought pattern gets us nowhere. Does it really? Let's just see what the responses are. Christy says, Hi Tom, I re-watched Heavy D's video at the interview in The Grain Shed with Justin and Candice Cooley yesterday. Instead of listening to what Candice Cooley said, I watched Heavy D's facial expressions whilst Candice Cooley was talking. His facial expressions are very interesting and make me think that we are not the only ones to have noticed Candice Cooley's lies. So that seems a bit unexpected, that. Maybe we'll have to have a look back at it and see, you know, how did Heavy D react to certain responses by Candice. But my response to Tom initially was, Tom, you're incorrect. As recently on my channel, I've been referring to and quoting what Justin Rounds has said in the past. Remember that? You know, Tom? Yes, in the past, Tom said, oh, well, Candice Cooley said this, Candice Cooley said that. And even if people get triggered or annoyed by that line, I'm just simply quoting where it came from. There's many people in this case that can say this, that, and the other, but never provide a source as to where it came from and just say, oh, well, I can't say because it's some kind of secret going on. I can't reveal their name. And it's like, well, what good does that do? You know, if people out there are trying to pass on information and, you know, they want us to believe in it, well, we need a source as to where it came from to know if we can trust it or not. If there's a high level of secrecy, I uh, know it, it might put people's backs up. And if we're already dealing with a case in community where there's a lot of, 
you know, untrustworthy people at times, it, it's going to lead to trust issues within others down the line. So then when you do have to believe and trust in to somebody that's revealing something which they can't exactly reveal deeply about or where it came from, it just makes it a very tricky situation. That's why, for the most part of it, when I do my videos, when I add my coverage, if there is additional information, I refer back to where it came from, or I at least try to, right? So it's a bit clearer. And yeah, quite a bit of it has been from what Candice Cooley has said. Now, have I always said from what Candice Cooley has said, that means it's true? No, not always. I've said that you know, on a normal circumstance, if family members, friend, or someone directly within the case who's around certain resources and authority, you would like, you would hope to think that they're telling the truth and they're being honest, right? Because if you don't believe in them, who do you believe in, right? Some third party person who's not even involved in the case or someone who is. That's all I was referring to. And as said, Tom, as of recently, I've been focusing much deeper on Justin Rounds because there is a time and place for everything. Whilst for quite some time, Candice Cooley has been questioned, called out, and a bit of a witch hunt at times, Justin Rounds has been let off the loose. And I just simply did analysis here and there questioning him, comparing and contrasting to Candice Cooley. And I think it opened up people's eyes as of recently because certain perspectives have changed ever since. Okay? And as I was saying... Some of the stuff Justin Rounds has said has been in agreement with Candice Cooley and other times where he's spoken for himself and by himself without any interruptions from Candice Cooley, Justin still has said things which have tied in line with what Candice Cooley has said other times. So there are levels of consistencies. It could be consistently incorrect or consistently inaccurate, but there is some form of consistency. Can Justin Rounds think for himself? Yes. But then does he retract it afterwards? Yes. And I've documented that with time. Anyway, move inside. Jacqueline saying, great poem, Indiana. I love it. So people do appreciate Indiana's poems. June says, I seem to miss the live premieres. And also, to be gifted membership, you need to turn your gift setting to on. And whose trailer was Brenner? And whose trailer was Brenner found in that could tell us if he was squatting? I think they meant the hate crime is regarding Dylan being gay. No, no. The family and the police have never brought it up about Dylan being gay. The people... Uh, well, actually, let me refer to that in a second, okay? So, um, June, when I do my live premieres... For most part of it, it's 9.15pm UK time, and that's roughly how it's been for the last year or so, okay? You say, to be gifted membership, you need to turn it on in the settings, that's correct, you know? So, if there's anybody watching right now, or watching in the background, and you want to receive the chance of a gifted membership, if anyone does gift memberships on my channel, as demonstrated recently... You'll have to go into your own settings on your channel and find it that way. And if you can't quite find it, just type in on Google, how do I turn on gifted membership? And it will explain quite clearly. Okay. Um, but referring back to June where it says, whose trailer was Brenner found in? Well, it wasn't a matter of Brenner being found in a trailer because he was, he was never hiding to begin with. Family police search and rescue knew where he was because he was, you know, squatting on that property. And Corey has mentioned it as well. And she's aware of the area. So the bit about the hate crime, Dylan being gay, the only reason why the whole gay theory came from was Jim Terry and some of his audience members and that side of the community. And then it dragged on from there back and forth. Now, why is the whole gay theory so, like, focused and intense at a point? Why was certain people so, you know, passionate to push that idea and that concept? Is it because they're gay themselves? I don't know. I mean, people were saying that Black Dove got involved at one point because of the whole relating, because of the, the relationship aspect and stuff behind that. And it's like, well, I mean, has there been enough evidence to prove that Dylan is gay? 
But then you just ask on and say, well, has it led to Dylan being killed because of that? I mean, look at Brenner. I mean, his motives behind it. There are other motives to suggest why Brenner did what he did over the whole gay stuff. Okay. But I'm sure it'll just go round and round in circles, that aspect, right? But at least the the hate crime aspect, yes, it was vague in that article or news report what we did look at recently. But I think it's talking about other themes. Anyway. June says, about Lance Kelly's recent video about the burnt cars. No, I was asking if it was the same place as a scrapyard. Now that I feel it was the place we spoke of. Just strange that we're talking about the topic and he puts a similar video out at that time. So yeah, I don't know if it is the same place, but I do agree. It is weird timing, bit of a coincidence. But then again, there's been times in the past where I've mentioned something. I've covered a video, a topic, and the next thing you know, somebody else has done something similar or has been inspired by it, but it's not been acknowledged. So maybe it's their own idea at the time, or maybe they were influenced in some way. The timing, the coincidences have been known to happen. We've got Glenn there, smooth fishing, saying, I still don't understand how Candice Cooley and Justin Rounds could leave their son out there all this time and knowing they could have brought him home already, laid him to rest in his family resting place. Christy says they explain it almost perfectly in the Heavy D video of the interview in the Grain Shed. It's pretty shocking. I rewatched it yesterday and noticed things I didn't see at the time. So it looks like Christy has picked up on some key things regarding the second ever and last interview between Heavy D, Candice Cooley, Justin Rounds inside of the Grain Shed. Maybe I will look back at the video and check it myself to see if I can pick up on anything. So, uh, Christy, uh, it's interesting what you have picked up on. This guy here, user, saying, is there a pig farm out close to Dylan's farm? Because if so, I think that should have been checked. First, pigs will eat anything except for teeth, just food for thought. That's a fair point, yes. Um, a couple of people over time have suggested that as well. As for pig farms within the area, I'm not quite sure if they're present. There has been... References in the past though that Kurt Wadsworth, Dylan Rounds both had pigs, but then parted ways down the line, but that was in the past. And then another time in the past where Dylan Rounds had pigs and Breno was involved and it led to some kind of argument falling out with Justin and Breno, which then led to Breno threatening to kill Justin in the past. A big red flag, but it seems to be brushed off casually by the family. So there's that. Skeptical saying... Ding, ding, ding. There goes the bell. Warlight Ref, you've hit it on the head. You hit the nail on the head. Candice Cooley tries to diminish the family's relationship with James Brenner by stating he was not a family friend, but only an acquaintance out of guilt for not addressing the issue that is James Brenner when Dylan was alive. Justin Rounds was very aware of James Brenner. True. The same goes for Don Hatley and is that Kurt Wadsworth? The same goes for the owners stating James Brenner was squatting on the shed property instead of living there with knowledge because it makes the guilt easier to deal with. Those closest to Dylan were very aware of James Brenner. More respect would be given if they admitted we knew he was there. We knew what he was capable of. No one is to be blamed for James Brenner's actions, but they should admit Dylan's death may have been prevented. So I'll take that into consideration, sceptical. I will, you know, refer to that. I think, is, is that what we're talking about next? Yes, we are. So it's very good time in this. Let me share with you my thoughts and response to this. Before I go any further elaborating to that by sceptical, is that if you have just suddenly joined or new to this video, be sure to rewind back earlier on so you've not missed out on anything. Just so you're up to date and know what we're talking about here. Feel free to rewind, okay, or catch up later. But as of right now, to add on or to give my additional thoughts regarding this, and anyone watching right now in the live chat or comment section, you can give, give your own thoughts. Maybe we can do a poll as well. I don't know if I did one last night or not, but basically it's around the theme and discussion, and it's a main part of this video, that... When it comes to Candice Cooley, because it was only her that responded to it, okay? Justin Rounds has had his stories and encounters to do with Brenner. We can briefly refer to that later if need be. Justin hasn't really commented on it. But 
the reason why Candice Cooley abruptly said and you know, almost passionately and stood firm to the point and fact and state that she truly believes and states in that article or that news response interview video that Brenner is nothing more than an acquaintance and that is it. That Brenner has never been a family friend, a friend of a family, you know, none of that. Don Hatley, though, has been considered a family friend and that hasn't been denied, has it? Candice Cooley hasn't said that, Justin Rounds hasn't said that. But there is a deeper story behind that as well, which we have referred to. We can bring it up again shortly because it does tie in with Brenner as well. But just talking about the surface level at this moment in time, am I surprised that Candice Cooley was very abrupt in disagreeing with that other news article, a different independent news article, which labelled Brenner as a family friend? You call it that way, a family friend friend of a family member, whichever way around you word it. And I guess when Candice Cooley saw it worded that way, she was not too pleased with it. Would you be pleased with seeing that yourself if you're in that situation? I guess it depends, right? You know, in the mindset of Candice Cooley and the way this case has gone, Brenner killed Dylan Rounds from the way the evidence is shaping up and the, the way the case has gone in general, right? So if that's truly the situation and if you're the mother at that moment in time and that this killer of your son is being regarded as a friend of your family, you're probably not going to take that too well. You're going to be thinking, uh, excuse me, just simply an acquaintance. I want nothing more to do with him ever again. Okay, you might not want anything to do with him ever again from now on, but what about the past? Was the past different? before this happened, before bad things unfolded, right? It's easy to, you know, disconnect from someone all of a sudden and disassociate with them and to label them nothing more as just an acquaintance or um, neutral terms with somebody and that is it. But what were the relations? What were the, you know, interactions like back then when things were slightly better and a bit more neutral, I think it would have been different because there were examples to demonstrate that as well, which we can acknowledge shortly. So I think, just in my opinion, that Brenner was a family friend, just like how Don Hatley was of, you know, the likes of the Rounds side, okay? But I feel that the reason why Candice Cooley denied it or rejected that claim is because she feels ashamed or embarrassed that she was once associated with someone like Brenner as to what eventually happened to her own son because of Brenner. She can't come to terms with that. She just can't, you know, grasp it in a sense and feels disgusted by the fact that she once saw Brenner as a possible friend in some way, right? Take it into consideration, Technically speaking, Kurt Wadsworth's response to Brenner being charged with the murder and desecration of Dylan Rounds on Salty Pancake's live stream that time, where uh, Kurt Wadsworth was like, no, he can't do it. He, he didn't kill Dylan Rounds. It's all a lie. He was never responsible. He did nothing wrong at all from what Kurt Wadsworth said. But as you know, Kurt Wadsworth been friends with Brenner and also been friends with Dylan. So to be able to comprehend that one of your friends took out another friend of yours is hard to process, right? And there's a level of denial, a defensive nature barrier put up. You put those walls up, that shield from the truth, which you store deep within your mind and you don't want to think about until maybe down the line when it's a bit too late, okay? So I think that's how it is with Candice Cooley. She just doesn't want to admit that Brenner was once a friend of the family after what's happened, right? Just imagine if down the line or right now, if Don Hatley was suddenly accused and arrested and charged with assisting in the desecration or murder of Dylan. I bet the family or more so Candice Cooley would suddenly say, oh, Don Hatley, he's not a friend of ours. He's an acquaintance. Oh, an acquaintance now, but a friend back then. Well, things have changed since, haven't they? And relationships, um, statuses change based on maybe ongoing factors and changes of events, which if they leave a bad taste in your mouth, you may not want anything to do with them anymore. And you're trying to raise all that history from the past you had with that one individual or two. But when you look back at a time when it was once better, 
it did exist, some kind of bond between people, and that can't be completely ignored, can it, right? So I think that's the case there. Why didn't Justin Rounds say anything? I think it's because he knows that, you know, about Brenner in the past and things that did happen, and maybe Justin Rounds doesn't want to accept certain rea realities possibly, but let's just slow it down, okay? Because it's a very vague thing, this, and it is much deeper than you think, you know, if, you, if you're trying to make sense of it on the spot. So as I said, we look at someone who's regarded as a family friend of the Cooley Rounds family, more so the Rounds family, and that is Don Hatley, right? When it comes to Don Hatley, wintertime 2020, doing some farm work assisting, got injured, got hurt, Dylan Rounds, Larry Rounds, Karen Rounds, the grandparents, looked after Don and helped him in different ways and, you know, getting him about to places. So with that close proximity, right, talking with one another, hanging out, stopping by, a bond was formed, a friendship was formed, kind of a long time one. So that's a positive there. And then Don was able to start working for Dylan, which is another positive there. But in the meantime, Don had a longtime friend himself, which was Brenner. Now, was Brenner in Lucin, Utah at the time of wintertime 2020? I don't think so. I think Brenner was still somewhere in Montello, Nevada, 2020, or at least before that. Because in 2019, at least, Brenner's trailer visible on the maps, was in Montello, Nevada, near the, the mountainous area, as we've documented before. As for 2020, not too sure about that, as for the timeline there, but onwards, onwards past that point, Brenner eventually went to Lucin, Utah. One, because his trailer was burnt down in uh, Montello, Nevada, and he was just, like, advised to, I think, by Ed Harshbarger and slash or Kurt Wadsworth, so he did move on over to Lucin, Utah, it's probably best for his own interest and the locals because with Brenner being a bit troublesome at times, him getting away from that place and going to an even more desolate location, more of a ghost town with even a smaller population, it was better for him, right? So did did Brenner go move to the grain shed property before Dylan Rounds started farming at his own place, his own property? I can't remember who got there first. And it's kind of important in a way, but at the same time, not so much. It depends how you look at it, because if people are wording it as that Brenner was on the land before, well, not on Dylan's land, but within the area, let's say, before Dylan came on down, bought the land, and then started farming there, then you could argue and say, well, the family should have known better. The family should have known that Brenner was down there. But would the family have been aware of who was down there and who exactly it was. No, not really. Because I'm just trying to tie in line. If you got wintertime 2020, okay, you got Don Hatley already in the presence of the likes of Dylan Rounds, uh, Larry Rounds, Karen Rounds, and then being introduced to Justin Rounds and it developing then, I guess Candice Cooley as well, being introduced at some point, and that was 2020 onwards. At what point exactly was Brenner then introduced? They didn't give a date, unfortunate, I know. But Don um, supposedly, you know, introduced his longtime friend Brenner, wherever Brenner was at that time, to Dylan Rounds and maybe some of the Rounds family members. And that's when Dylan accepted Brenner and said, you can work for me. It was kind of on and off, but you see how things were passed on. You got Don Hatley first, seen as... Um, uh, family friend getting on well good terms and then Don recommends and introduces Brenner uh, the family members more likely to welcome Brenner at the time because Don's seen as a good person to them and if Don has recommended one of his friends then that must be a good thing at the time so that's what created that acceptance right that awareness of who was who at the time and getting on somewhat well okay no issues there and then you got Brenner working for Dylan on and off, etc. Fast forward onwards to a, a certain point where Dylan and Brenner were doing custom farm work elsewhere. And in Idaho, I think that's where they were living at, at the time, Brenner and Dylan, at the back of Candice Cooley's backyard, 
so in close proximity to her, for Candice Cooley to welcome Brenna to stay there for two months with Dylan whilst doing custom farm work, there must have been more than acquaintances for Candice Cooley to trust that Brenna could be in the proximity of her and her own son for that length of time in a close proximity, right? You've got to have a level, a level of trust, right? I mean, you can have acquaintances, you can have colleagues, you can work with people or for people, you can talk, you can interact, but it doesn't mean to say that you're friends with one another. But if you start, I don't know, hanging out with one another, um, having drinks with one another, stopping by, hanging out outside of work time, it could be considered more of a, um, a friendship, right? And, you know, depending on the situation, maybe more than that. In this case, more friends working with each other. So yeah, Brenna was working for Dylan, but then other times Dylan and Brenna were working together side by side for somebody else when doing the custom farm work. So it wasn't always one-sided there. And because, you know, for Candice Cooley to, al to allow Dylan to work with Brenna and Brill Brenna to work with Dylan and to be in proximity together as well as at her own place, there must have been a trust, right? Because I don't think Candice Cooley would just welcome anyone into her backyard, right? Just in case they were a criminal or they robbed something or harmed somebody. So I believe that's an example that they were friends and were on neutral terms at least and got on well back then. It's just that fast forward onwards to 2022, May 28th and onwards, after hearing about what's happened to her son, Candice Cooley, and who's responsible, Brenner, from the looks of it, you know, you kind of think, damn, I trusted that person. It's like the line of, I let you into our family. I let you into our house and this is how you repay us. It's that level of disgust and shock. Trying to process it but at the same time, pushing all those memories from the past. Even if there are positive memories you once associated with that person who is now nothing more than an enemy to you or that they're dead to you. But you just like suppress all the past good things which happened at a time when that person wasn't as bad. So I think... Just a reaction from Candice Cooley, besides the stories of what we've been told in the past, is enough to suggest that Candice Cooley re once regarded Brenner as a friend of the family or one of the families, Cooley family or the Rounds family, right? That's what I would say. And for Don to introduce Brenner to them, to Dylan, and there was acceptance, then there's a level of friendliness, right? Helping one another out. So that's the way I see it. Now, what about Justin Rounds? Well, maybe Justin Rounds wouldn't consider Brenner a friend, but still put up with him. And the reason why I say that is because on two different occasions, and they're both in the past, so before 2021, a couple of years before that, um, Justin Rounds said how when Dylan was uh, in the possession of pigs, some kind of farming stuff, right? Whatever you call it, with pigs. And Brenner was present at the time. Well, when I think about it, you know, when you're tying the different stories together, I said these stories were told at random times. One was in the Heavy D interview, another one was in maybe the Nate Eaton one or the Doug interview. It's a bit all over the place, right? So the timing and the you know the year is a bit mixed up. But if we're thinking about it, to be fair, if Justin referred to winter time of 2020 when Don was present, and then onwards past that, onwards, that's when Don introduced Brenner to Dylan Rounds, and that's when Brenner started working for Dylan, and that's when they were together then, in the presence, then if Dylan had pigs and was in the presence of Brenner with those pigs on where they were planning on taking them, then it must be 2020 onwards, yeah because uh, Don would have already introduced Brenner beforehand, and that's why they are where they are now. Yeah. So onwards 2020, past winter time, past that. Uh, Justin was recalling that story that Dylan had pigs, and Brenner was present. They were taken to opposite grandparents' house. Justin didn't like the idea of that, for whatever reason. Justin did show a bit of resistance and disagreement with Brenner, and that's afterwards, after that, you know, words of arguments, conflicts, whatever, but Justin left the area, leaving Brenner 
and Dylan behind. And that's when Brenner said to Dylan and used threatening language in response to how he felt that Brenner didn't like the way he was spoken to by Justin Rounds. So in response to that, when Justin wasn't present, Brenner said, I'm going to kill Justin Rounds. That's, that's pretty straight to the point, right? And quite a serious threat. That's not good. For Dylan Rounds to be present, for Dylan Rounds to hear Brenner say that he's going to kill Dylan's father. So obviously Dylan responded and, you know, called or messaged Justin Rounds about it. Justin Rounds didn't seem too phased by it. And, you know, I think they had another talk afterwards and it was kind of resolved. But still, that early on, before Dylan being taken out a few years beforehand, about two years beforehand or so, and Brenner threatened to kill Justin Rounds. Fast forward two, two or a few years on, and it's Brenner actually killing Justin's son, complete opposite way around. Major red flag. And then in between from back then till the death of Dylan, 2021, was it winter time? I'm not quite sure. But Justin Reek told a story about that as well when he was having that interview with Heavy D and the second interview in the Grain Shed. That when Candice Cooley and Justin Rounds were in the Grain Shed, Justin said how back in 2021, when Don Hatley, Brenner, Dylan, and some person that was working for Justin at the time were all at his shop. And that when Dylan left the room or went elsewhere, leaving Don Hatley, Brenner together, and Justin was in a different room next to CCTV and audio. He was able to listen in, and Brenner was calling out Dylan, disrespecting him, insulting him, disagreement, showing jealousy and a bit of anger and a bit of hatred towards Dylan for what Dylan had and what he could do and how he was treating the equipment. And Justin highlighted in that interview of Heavy D's that, that Brenner did appear quite jealous, etc., so on two different occasions, Justin Rounds witnessed a dark side behind Brenner, but still put up with Brenner and still allowed Dylan to be in the presence of Brenner, right? Was Candice Cooley ever aware of any of that? I don't know. Did Justin Rounds ever tell her? I don't know, right? I know people can have a go at Candice Cooley and say, well, she should have done her research and her homework of the area of Luton. She shouldn't have allowed Dylan to go over there and do the farming because it was dangerous. No wonder why uh, whatever happened to Dylan happened because Candice Cooley allowed it. But what about Justin Rounds when Justin Rounds knew what Brenner was capable of? Threats, warnings, potentially killing someone. Justin did nothing to stop that. That seems more serious than someone who doesn't do any homework at all. If you're in a position where you do know of stuff, but you don't do anything to prevent it, that's more of a problem than someone who just has no clue and oblivious, right? So at a point in time, Candice Cooley may have once regarded Brenner as some form of a friend of family, but then ever since has rejected that claim and is disgusted in it and maybe feel ashamed. So reduces it to that of a an acquaintance so then when the general public see the news or hear about it then they don't what don't complain or question her as much and it's like well you're not going to know if it's just an acquaintance you, you're not going to know what they're capable of but then if it was a friend you could get questioned more and people could say how did you not know how did you not see the the warning signs you know if you're friends with them surely you would have learned about them their tendencies their personality behavior the traits and all that you could have prevented it it would have led to more questioning so i think that's another factor to why candace cooley didn't want to refer or acknowledge that brenner was once a friend right because of that additional questioning suspicion and being attacked in a way but then you got justin rounds who hasn't really said anything at all hasn't really referred to it or questioned or responded back to the way it was worded in that article, news one online, transcript or video. It's just kept quiet. Now, I know people have praised Justin for keeping quiet, more controlled, more accurate in what he says when he does talk, but sometimes people keep quiet when they may feel guilty of something. So I know you can argue and say, well, it's good at Justin Rounds to tell the story of what happened way back in the past, but Justin wasn't thinking too much of it at the time and that when Dylan in 2020 
to 2020, is it 2020? Yeah, yeah, sometime in 2020, when Dylan responded back to Justin about the whole threatening situation, Dylan Rouse said, oh, it's nothing to be too problematic about, it's just Brené can be an ass at times. And that was it. Just Brenna being Brenna, playing it off, right? Why was Dylan playing it off? Why did Dylan not take it serious? Is it because Dylan has heard it all before by Brenna? Threats here, threats there. Empty words, empty promises, but eventually it did catch up, I wonder. Was Dylan Rounds trying to defuse the situation because he was scared himself? I don't know. But I think if you are threatened, people do respond to that seriously, don't they? Well, most of the time. I know some people out there will think, oh yeah, that was that was a funny joke you made there. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're gonna kill that person. Yeah, right, yeah. But sometimes it can happen. And if you underestimate it, it can leave you vulnerable. So maybe you could argue and say Justin Rounds didn't act upon it at the time when he should have done. You know, if Brenner in the past threatened Candice Cooley and Justin Ra um, if Dylan told Candice Cooley about it, how would she have reacted if Candice Cooley was in the shoes of Justin Rounds upon being threatened that Brenner was going to kill her? Maybe she would take more action, right? You go, know I'm saying, just like a massive, major red flag. Everyone can say, oh, Dylan could still be alive to this day if he wasn't taken down to losing, if, if family intervened earlier or if they were aware of the dangers down there. But, uh, and then you, but you got Justin, who was threatened by Brenner, threatened to be killed by Brenner, and nothing happened, nothing came from that. That's where the biggest issue is, in my opinion, right? I said, I know the, the dates or the years are a bit mixed up, right? Of what year did Brenner move on down to the Grain Shed property? Was it, it was, was it in 2020 at some point? I mean, it would have happened before because then it was then Don Hatley in 2020 onwards, past winter, that then introduced Brenner to the family to then... Dylan upset Brenner for working under him, right? So, if you say that Candice Cooley should have known more, or that she already knew that Brenner was in Lucen, I don't know if that's entirely true or not, but that aside, you got someone like Justin who's been on the receiving end on a more serious matter regarding Brenner being threatened to be killed by him, which is more of a red flag, at least. So, I don't know, it just, it feels there is more to it around that aspect, but I can only say so much at this moment in time of what I know or what I think, right? But I just genuinely feel that there is a bit more to it, there's a bit more of a deeper topic around the theme of, was Brenner a friend or an acquaintance? And how did the different family members treat Brenner and react to Brenner at different points back then and how they do now? And did any of the f family members, friends, besides Justin Rounds, ever have any negative run-ins with Brenner in the past? Because there could be a possibility that maybe they did at points, but they don't want to admit it now because they may feel ashamed or they may feel like they'll be blamed for Dylan's death because they didn't do anything back then to prevent it, right? All about the the early warning signs, right? Maybe Candice Cooley is more likely to not acknowledge bad actions by Brenner from the past if she ever had a run-in with him or a disagreement, right? Because if she's quick to say, oh, Brenner is just an acquaintance and nothing more, but maybe there were friends back then, if she's quick to change it up to avoid the shame, to avoid the questioning, to avoid the attacking, maybe Candice Cooley has had a bad interaction with Brenner in the past. But it's not been talked about. At least Justin talked about it. That's something, I guess. Do people understand where I'm coming from here? Just let me know in the chat. And share your own thoughts and add on if you want yourself. But yeah, I would say, in my opinion, end of the day, it does appear that Brenner was once a family friend. And now is seeing nothing more than once an acquaintance, but there was more to it, okay? Next thing, what about that strange line by Candice Cooley? This is a different kind of like 
topic area within the case. Just want to highlight it once again. I mentioned it in the comments recently, but I just want to see what other people think about it. Where Candice Cooley said in a Facebook post in memory of Dylan Rounds, saying, Dylan Rounds had a short life, but accomplished so much more than what other people would do in, in an entire lifetime. One well, of those typical lines. But Candice Cooley also said about how the, the way it went for Dylan Rounds, it was almost as if it was meant for Dylan to have a short life, to make the most of it, to live it and be successful in such a short amount of time, but to have a short life, though overall it was meant to be that way. What? Is that talking from the Bible as something religiously speaking? It seems like it. To say it kind of casually, oh yeah, and, and my son that was killed, it's all bad, should never have happened, but it's almost as if it was Dylan's calling to be killed, to be murdered. It was meant to be that Dylan Rounds was supposed to die early, still do well in the stages of life when he was alive, but the inevitable that he was going to die regardless. That's what it seems to be interpreted as. Now, some people could be like, well, where's the proof? Where's the proof? I've documented it in a past video. If you want to check it out, feel free to do so. It will be available on my channel. Feel free to check the playlist out. It will be there, okay? I just found it a bit weird by Candice Cooley to make it seem like it was already predetermined, right? If Candice Cooley is saying that Dylan Rounds was killed by Brenner and it was a snap moment, it wasn't planned, and yet for Candice Cooley to say it seems as if it was inevitable for Dylan Rounds to have a short life, that seems more planned beforehand, doesn't it? Huh. Or is it just a religious reference? Just let me know your thoughts. Was it a strange line for Candice Cooley to say? Does it highlight red flags? I've just seen, I've seen nobody else talking about it on other channels, right? Bob Farrell. Oh, Bob, I know you're there in the background, Bob. What do you think of Candice Cooley? when she said that line about Dylan. It was it was as if it was meant for Dylan to have a short life. Is that a normal thing to say? Let me know your thoughts, bub, wherever, whenever, okay? Anything else to add on? Well, besides that, it's the situation with Lance Kelly. I'm just gonna briefly talk about it, okay? So have a brief bit of water as well. What's going on with Lance Kelly? Well, I said, I don't follow everything because I've mainly been focusing on a case. I'm aware that Lance Kelly has been covering the case himself more so recently, but in addition, what, going down to North Carolina or something to be a part of that dog training program, whether it be to collect the dog or to get involved with the training at that point as of recently. Besides that, the last video, which was, what, three, five days ago of... Lance Kelly and maybe Kimber present where they were looking at those like abandoned cars, scrapped cars, some supposedly burnt down or broken down, whatever, right? That, what since? Nothing. What was before that then? Well, Indiana mentioned that Lance Kelly and Kimber's house in Montello, that like box thing where they were living out with their farm animals and stuff was broken into. That's incorrect. Indiana corrected herself afterwards. So that didn't happen. What did happen? Who was it by? I'm not quite sure. That when Lance Kelly was on the, the road trip, I guess on the route to North Carolina or something, apart from breaking down the drive shaft or something within the car, having a mechanical failure, breaking once again, as it did in the past, being stranded needing assistance in some way. Besides that, that Lance Kelly's vehicle was broken into, the back completely smashed in, the glass, etc. right? Who, who was it? Things stolen as well as items. Some people think it was done as a form of intimidation to put Lance Kelly off from searching for Dylan Rounds, even though it was in a completely different area. So yeah, Lance Kelly was saying that it was something to do with people within the area responsible. Who knows? Other people think Lance Kelly broke into his own vehicle for another supposed scam to make more money to appear as the victim, play the victim card, do a GoFundMe and benefit even further. Some people are saying that Lance Kelly Kimber have left 
the, their original place in Montello and have moved elsewhere. Yeah, what is going on? As I said, I don't follow everything in the background, but just little bits and bobs along the way. You know, where do my thoughts lie? Well, you look back. Has Lance Kelly been targeted or supposedly been targeted in the past? Well, first of all, you know, you got you got Ty Corbin, an individual that had his door kicked in to one of his places of living or where he would supposedly go to every now and then. Door kicked on in there, a few bits of furniture and items within damaged and fiddled about with, etc. Okay. Did anyone question that? Few people did. Few people thought that maybe Ty Corbin did it himself. And then others were feeling sorry for Ty, right? Then you had Lance Kelly. Which way was it? I'm just trying to think. Because there was another time with Lance Kelly, wasn't there? Besides his window being smashed. Oh yeah, when Lance Kelly was at that motel. Was it in Wendover? Maybe. I think it might have been. Wendover Motel. It would, it would have to be, yeah. And Lance supposedly got screwed over. The family did because of one of the rooms. Was it because the AC wasn't working or the water or electricity was out? Something like that. And uh, basically, Lance Kelly was getting a bit frustrated. And then I think shortly afterwards, upon prancing around the the area and walking around up and down whilst filming himself doing a live stream, that's when he got swatted live by the police. But some people were claiming that Salty Pancakes was behind it because not far away, Salty Pancakes was within the area at the time and did it as a prank and was watching at the time it happened. Was that the case? I don't know. I don't know, but Lance Kelly got swatted. Now, are people saying that did Lance do that himself? Swat himself to make it seem more drama and interesting. I don't know. But I guess I guess the more times a person becomes a victim to all these crimes or unjustly actions, you, you start to think, huh, are they a victim because they're targeted? That there is a grudge against them? That there are other people out there out to get that one? Over and over again, multiple attempts to hopefully scare the person off or to stop them doing whatever they're doing? Or is it more so the person is making himself appear more of a victim than they actually are by setting it up? There's levels of scepticism, isn't there? What would I honestly say? Honestly, I think if Lance Kelly's car, it was broken into, but in a completely different area, I would suggest maybe... It was an unfortunate moment, wrong place, wrong time situation, but it doesn't link to the Dylan Rounds case. What about what about the time where... No, I, I, don't, I don't know. There's not really too much to say at the end of it. Like, I've not been around Lance Kelly that much to, you know, do that, like, like analysis, that body language behavioural thing, like what I've done with other people over time. I think for most part of it, people see, well maybe not most, but quite a few people, visualise Lance Kelly as a scammer, some kind of fraud person, okay? Background things, messy stuff, monetary gain, and in the past as well, so people saying that that's why they left whatever city they came from and moved there out in the outdoors of Montello and then moved on since to another scam or to make money elsewhere, always on the go. Is that really happening? I don't know. Right? If they have moved away, then does that mean that no more searches for Dylan Rounds? That was really the case. That really did happen. Well, mm, then really no one's searching for Dylan Rounds then. Besides, well, Ty Corbin. Yeah, it just seems, you know, right now this video is very quiet. It's kind of flat. Atmosphere, not talking as much. The flow isn't there. But this is kind of like the levels of what it will be like out there, such as right now. If Lance Kelly family have moved on, not in the area anymore for whatever reason, genuine or not, no longer searching for Dylan Rounds. And if the official searches aren't happening that much, as people have questioned, then is anyone really looking for Dylan Rounds? I know you can't expect people to be looking for Dylan all the time, right? Because people do have responsibilities and 
background stuff going on in life. But when it gets to that realization that maybe no one else is looking for Dylan anymore, or it really has slowed down, it's like, damn, maybe it hits you hard, that realization kicking on in. Hmm. So do you know what my question is? If it was the process, right, just on the basis, not that it's 100% true, but just on the basis from what other people have said, I just want your answer to this question. If Lance Kelly and the family at Kimber were doing it to scam people to make money from the Dylan Browns case to benefit in other ways, to portray it as if they're searching and that they care for Dylan, but they're doing it for other reasons, and they've done what they've done, they've moved on now to elsewhere, if that truly was the case, then does that mean all of Lance Kelly's videos when searching about were all for nothing then? Does that further mean that when Lance was out there and was checking out locations, he never had it in his mind that he was intentionally trying to find Dylan or the remains? Is that what you agree with or not? It's a bit extreme now, but I'm just basing it on you know people's ideas that they think Lance Kelly like a scamming aspect to it like if that really was the case that Lance Kelly had no actual intention of finding Dylan Rounds just went out there to record himself to make it look like he was searching about when he was just exploring for his own interest in the area collecting rocks and looking at bones of animals etc and going into caves mine shafts which would be not accessible by the likes of Brenner or Don because of the, the narrowness and unlikely that Dylan would end up in there unless it was from a height dropping down into a mine shaft, as I've described previously. If that was all the case, well, what does that mean at the end of the day? Like, if Lance didn't really have it in his mind to be finding Dylan and he was just randomly out there, what would have happened if Lance did find Dylan? Would Lance have you know, followed accordingly and at least reported it in, or would he just been like, oh, there's some remains, oh well, just move on. I think personally, you know, whether Lance Kelly is genuinely doing it to search for Dylan or making it seem like he cares for Dylan so then he can gain favour and support from others, I do think that if Lance Kelly ever stumbled across remains, he would document uh, or at least report it into the police or the family somewhere or another. Whether he was doing it for himself or he was doing it for Dylan, he would likely act on it if he found the remains of Dylan. And people could say, no, he wouldn't. Well, he would, because in the eyes of the general public that don't agree with Lance Kelly and seem in a darker way, seem that he could benefit off this and benefit off that, well, if Lance came across remains... He could be seen and labelled as the hero. He would get maybe some of the fame and fortune. I don't know. He could benefit out of it in some way. So it would encourage and motivate him to report on it and document it. And if it wasn't that, and it was just because Lance Kelly truly cares about Dylan, the family, etc., determined to do what he does and put all that time in, that he would report on it in that sense. So just my thoughts on it, okay? I said... I've not been on the receiving end of Lance Kelly, not in a negative way, so I can't say too much. What I said beforehand was on the basis of what other people have said, not coming from my mouth, not coming from exactly my opinion, okay, the most part of it. I just wanted to address that now, just in case people got the wrong story and got it all mixed up. Hopefully most people understand, um, but you know what? As for some people that don't understand, off topic, branching away from the Dylan Rounds case right now. Put that aside, okay? If there are any troublesome people, okay? Any degenerates messing about, causing any trouble in chat, it can be fixed very quickly, okay? You don't know what this is? Well, don't worry, I will introduce you to it right now. And no handshake is needed, okay? No hands. Wow, that sounds great, doesn't it? Not quite for you. Yeah, you're confused by this? You don't like it? Well, tough. This is what happens to naughty people.
If you want to be a naughty individual, you want to act out, you want to be a bit spasmodic, well, this will come answering and calling, okay? How many times will it respond back? I don't know. It depends how many times you act yourself out of place. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you understand that. And we can finally resume to the conclusion of this video, okay? As I said, this video itself, all in all, is just a collection of different, you know, talking points as of recently within the case. And I didn't want it to end completely on a cliffhanger or, or a dead end from what we last talked about, which, what was it, the weather, the winter time aspects, because that's still approaching. And before that, we've still got the court case appearance from Brenner, which is closing in ever so close. So there is that as well. But this was a bulk video what I just wanted to combine all together from what I've recently heard of and share my thoughts. Hopefully you understood the video, maybe you enjoyed it. Be sure to like and share if you want to spread awareness on the case and keep it alive about Dylan. And as well, feel free to leave comments or questions or even grievances down below in the comment section. And yeah, you can check the links out if you want in the pinned comments and even check out the earlier video I did today. But I think all in all for now, that's it. Apologies if the flow wasn't as full on this time round, but I guess, you know, it's just like no script, thinking on the spot, trying one's best. So hopefully it was good enough. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. For now, goodbye and good night.